Hello and welcome back. Um, today we're going to discuss the muscular system and uh, this is one of my favorite systems. It's a, it's a pretty complicated system and uh, I'm going to give you everything I got with it so that you can get a better sense of, uh, of how it works. So if you remember back, we talked about when we did the uh, body organization, we talked about how there are different kinds of tissues. And uh, there's epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and then there's muscular tissue. So just to refresh your memory, there is cardiac muscle tissue, and that's uh, the tissue that's going to uh, be found in your heart and run in your heart. There's smooth muscle tissue, and this is the, this is the muscle tissue that's going to surround like digestive organs, the iris of your eye. Um, you know, it surrounds blood vessels, the uterus, and uh, it's involuntary. So today what we're going to focus on mainly is skeletal muscle tissue. And this is the muscle tissue that can be found, um, you know, attached to um, exoskeletons of insects or endoskeletons like your endoskeleton that you have attached to bones. And this is voluntary and uh, we're going to talk about its anatomy and uh, how it actually works. So there are many functions of this, this system we call the muscular system. Of course, you're familiar with movement. Um, but also it maintains body posture and body position. So it uh, stabilizes joints. It generates heat to keep our bodies warm if we're, if we're warm-blooded. Um, it propels food. Uh, it also forms valves to ensure a one-way uh, passage of food through the body. So, you know, in between your esophagus and your stomach, there is a valve right there. It's called the upper esophage, the lower esophageal valve, and that prevents, you know, acid coming back up into your esophagus. There's also a pyloric valve that uh, allows food to go into your small intestine. So we have these uh, these valves, these sphincters, all throughout our body to ensure the passage of food through the digestive tract in the correct way. Um, mus muscles also control the size of your pupil, so they're found in your iris of your eye. So if you look at a human eye. There's your pupil right there. The iris, the color portion of your eye, is a series of muscles that can contract or relax to allow the pupil to get bigger or smaller. Um, it also protects, you know, your muscular system protects uh, internal digestive uh, organs or internal organs. It expresses emotions if you look at uh, facial uh, muscles. So lots of different jobs. This is a few of them that I put for, um, for you to understand. So I did want to talk about that there are, you know, different kinds of skeletons. So if you look at this example over here, this is the example of an exoskeleton, and it shows you muscles attached to the exoskeleton. Uh, you know that arthropods don't have endoskeletons. They don't have bones inside their body, so the muscles have to attach to the exoskeleton in order to cause movement of, uh, of its appendages. Um, so that's one system of, of, uh, of using muscles. Another system is using an endoskeleton. So we don't have an exoskeleton, but we do have internal bones. You know, so here's the radius right here, and here's the biceps attached to it, and it attaches up here to, um, to your scapula. Um, so, um, so that's an endoskeleton example of uh, muscle movement. All right. So now I want to get into talking about how a muscle in a vertebrate animal is, uh, is arranged and how it's attached to uh, and connected to the uh, endoskeleton. So um, if we just take a look at uh, this particular part here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit. So you can see that muscles are attached to bones. So up here, here's your bone. And uh, muscles are attached to bones via the part called the tendon. The tendon is a cord the tendon is a cord of connective tissue that allows the muscle to attach to a bone. Uh, bones do have a little skin, uh, it's called the periosteum, and uh, it does have a little skin that, uh, that uh, covers it over, and the, and the tendon will grow right into that periosteum uh, of, the, of the bone. And, uh, and uh, the tendon will grow into a covering around the muscle called fascia. So fascia, if you ever go to Walmart and look at a steak, that whitish material over the surface of a muscle is called fascia. And uh, covering the whole muscle is a layer of tissue called the epimyceum. It's just connective tissue that covers and encircles the whole muscle. Um, your muscle, if you look at a muscle in cross-section, 
Um, a muscle is made up, so if I take a, a muscle and I cut it in cross-section, it's made of a lot of these little units called fascicles. So each fascicle is covered by perimyceum, which is a covering around it. And, uh, and you can see the, the, in the perimyceum, there's actually uh, uh, blood vessels and nerves. I can see a blood vessel right there. But there's blood vessels and nerves that surround all of the, um, of the little bundles of, of, uh, of contracting units. And these little bundles are called fascicles. So you can see bundles of fascicles. Um, the artist does a nice job here by pulling a fascicle out. So the artist takes one of these bundles and pulls it out so that you can see what it looks like. And you can see that covering that bundle are blood vessels and there are nerves that are going to cover those little repeating units called fascicles. Um, so if we take a look at a fascicle, a fascicle is also made of re uh, repeating units. You can see down here that this fascicle is made of these repeating units. Each of these repeating units is a muscle fiber. Okay, so it's actually a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. Muscle fiber and muscle cell are interchangeable terms. And covering all of these muscle covering all of these muscle cells is an endomyceum, a covering around all of the muscle cells. Now, each muscle cell has its own cell membrane called a sarcolemma. And you can see the sarcolemma right here. It's a little sheath or covering uh, around the muscle cell. Uh, you can think of it as the cell membrane. Um, so muscle cells have very complex parts. We'll talk about some of these parts, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and they're also, if you look at a muscle cell, it's repeat, it has repeating units as well called myofibrils. So if I take one muscle cell, here's one muscle cell here, and you look at it, it's made of repeating units uh, of, 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 um, of proteins, uh, and these proteins are called myofibrils. And even these myofibrils are made of repeating units called filaments. There are thick filaments and there are thin filaments, and these particular parts are going to allow for a muscle cell to, uh, to cause contraction. Okay, so you might need to stop the video and go back and review the parts of a muscle. Um, you know, I want you to know all these parts. If you don't know these parts, you really won't know how a muscle really truly uh, works. All right, so I'm spending a little bit of time here before we talk about how a muscle actually works by describing some of its anatomy. We just looked at the gross anatomy by looking at how a muscle is arranged. Now we're going to look at some, of my, some microscopic anatomy of a muscle cell. Remember, muscle cell and muscle fiber are interchangeable terms. So all muscle cells are going to have a sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the cell membrane of the cell. And uh, it's specialized by having a few uh, specialized parts. So if you were to look at the sarcolemma, uh, it's not continuous, but there are invaginations, little indentions where the cell, where the sarcolemma actually goes into the interior of the cell. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a few minutes so you can see what that looks like. There is a specialized cytoplasm of the muscle cell called sarcoplasm, and uh, that's just the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. Inside of the sarcoplasm, there are going to be these structures called glycosomes, and these are little granules of glycogen. Now, if you remember back to Biology 101, glycogen is uh, basically a series of repeating units of glucose, and glucose is what runs muscle um, it gives energy and allows ATP to be formed inside of muscles. So we do have the ability to store glycosomes. If you exercise, uh, you actually store more glycosomes and actually create more glycosomes. If you don't exercise, you don't have as much stored energy in your muscle tissue. The muscle cells, uh, the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell also has myoglobin. This is a red pigment which stores oxygen. Uh, oxygen is really important for cellular respiration inside of the muscle cell. Um, the sarcoplasm also has those myofibrils. These are rod-like uh, structures that are made of the myofilaments, those little thick and thin filaments that we just saw, and those are repeating units. You may have hundreds of them in your muscle cells. You may have thousands of them, and it depends on how thick your muscles actually are. Well, the muscle cell also has a special um, endoplasmic reticulum called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is a special type, type of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And what it does is it stores and releases calcium. Calcium is a really uh, critical component to a muscle contraction uh, that you'll need for a muscle to contract. We also have mitochondria. 
and uh, these are the powerhouses inside of muscle cells and uh, there are there are three types of muscle tissue in humans and uh, and different types of muscle tissue or different types of muscle cells are going to have different amounts of mitochondria. Some muscle cells that are used for like sprinting are going to not have a lot of mitochondria, but muscle cells that are used for things like marathon running will have uh, tremendous numbers of mitochondria. And you can increase and decrease the amount of mitochondria that your muscle cells actually have, depending upon the level of exercise that you do. Okay, so here is kind of a, a you know more of a graphical form of, of what we just discussed. So muscle cells are unique in that they're multinucleated. You can see they have more than one nucleus inside the cell. These are gigantic cells. You're born with all the muscle cells you're ever going to have, and uh, they have the ability to regenerate themselves and grow, but they don't have the ability to grow in number. So you're born with the number that you're going to have. Actually, you were born with more muscle cells than you have now because some of them have died over time. Um, we also have uh, these uh, things called myofibrils. These are the repeating units that you can see inside of the of the muscle cell, and they're made of little thin thin filaments and thick filaments. So those are the myofibrils. The myofibrils uh, are going to be really critical uh, to our understanding of the physiology of uh, muscle cells. We also have sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's that specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum that is going to store calcium and uh, allow for muscle contraction to occur. Um, here you can see the little invaginations. These are the little T-tubules I was discussing earlier with you, and those are going to be really important in allowing muscles to work as well. Here's the sarcolemma on the outside surface. There are tons of mitochondria in some types of muscle cells, and those are little powerhouses that allow the muscle to uh, actually work. Sarcoplasm is going to be the cytoplasm of the muscle cell that allows for, um, you know, it, it's the storage unit. It's an aqueous uh, uh, part of the cell. It's the part that the myofibrils sit in and that the mitochondria sit in. And, uh, and then we have the, the cell membrane, the sarcolemma, as we just described just a second ago. Okay, so let's now discuss those myofibrils for a few minutes. Um, these are going to form the striations that you see with skeletal muscle tissue. So uh, down here in the left-hand corner, I have the skeletal muscle tissue. This is what you would see under, uh, under a light microscope, and you can see it's striated. Okay, it's striped. And these striations are because of the, of the repeating units, these myofibrils. And uh, inside of the myofibrils, there is a, a structure called a sarcomere, which is a repeating unit. And uh, I'm going to teach you about the, the anatomy of the sarcomere so you can kind of understand how it actually works. But a sarcomere, uh, and this one's done under electron microscopy, so they've taken this tissue and looked at it under electron microscope. And uh, what I like over here is the artist has drawn this so you can learn a little bit of the anatomy of the parts of it. But a sarcomere goes from this particular line to this particular line, and these are called Z-lines. So from Z-line to Z-line, you have what we call a sarcomere and that's a repeating unit you have hundreds of these repeating units in the myofibrils and you can see the Z lines these little dark lines are the are the Z lines that you can see making up these striations um, now there's different kinds of bands here you can see what we call an I band you can you can see an A band uh, you can see the Z line and you can see the M line and this is called the H zone this little uh, this little inner part here is called an H zone. Uh, you will be responsible for knowing that, so I would get a sense of looking over here at the artist's rendition so that you can see uh, how all these things uh, are named. Um, again, you won't understand how this thing works. I mean, you're here to learn how things work. You don't learn how these things work unless you know the anatomy of how uh, it's arranged. So I want to I wanna go through and talk a little bit more about the anatomy here with you for a second. I'm going to list them out for you so you can understand by definition what they are, and then we'll look at their anatomy one more time. So the I bands are the light bands, and they're made of this, this, this thin filament called actin, and the actin is going to be attached to the Z line. So if I have Z lines here, here is actin coming out, 
and this is going to be uh, basically part of the eye band that you'll see in just a second. But uh, the Z line is there. There's that thin filament that's attached to to the um, to the Z line. I'm just going to erase this so we'll keep a nice clean slate here. So the A bands are made of dark bands and uh, are, are dark bands, and they're composed of a region where the thick filament is going to overlap with the thin filament. So if I drew the, the M line, and here's a thick filament coming out, here's a thin filament, and here's the Z line. So these A bands are going to be made right here, and they're an overlap. The reason they're dark is because they're an overlap of the thin filament and the thick filament. Okay, so keep a clean slate. The H zone is a light region within the A band, and it contains the M line. I'll show you that in a picture in just a second. And the Z line is the mid interruption uh, in the I band. Okay, love this picture here. The artist did a great job uh, in describing this. So up here at the top drawing, we have um, you know the muscle cell. So this structure here is the muscle cell. And uh, you can see the Z line from Z line to Z line, it makes up a sarcomere. And uh, it's showing you over here the thick filaments called myosin, and it's showing you the thin filaments called actin. Okay, this whole structure right here, this whole circular structure is a myofibril. And down here, you can see what you would see under the uh, electron microscope. So you, you, you can see the from Z line to Z line is a sarcomere. And the lighter band here and here and here, those are called I bands. The darker bands are called A bands, and that's because you have an overlap of the thick and thin filament. So you can actually see the overlap of the thick and thin filament, and it's darker, and you can see that. Where you don't have uh, an overlap of the thick and thin filament, it's darker than the I band, but it's a little bit lighter. So that's just where you have the, the myosin or the thick filament. Okay, so you may want to rewind and take a look at uh, the different parts, the Z lines, the I band, A band, uh, and, uh, and the thick and thin filaments, just to refresh your memory. Okay, so another thing you need to know before we go into talking about how this stuff actually works is the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is a place where the um, muscle cell and nerve cell interse intersect. Now, skeletal muscles are voluntary, um, but you have to have a nerve that tells it what to do. And we have a special nerve called a motor neuron that's going to be commanding a muscle cell to, uh, to actually move. Uh, and this motor neuron has this has you know, an extension called an axon that comes down. And uh, at the very end, there's a little synaptic knob. So it's this little knob-like region here where you're going to have little vesicles of neurotransmitters that are going to be dumped and communicated to the um, to the muscle cell that's on this other side over here. Now there is a space here called the synaptic cleft. And that cleft is going to be a space that these neurotransmitters have to be dropped into to communicate to a muscle cell. So muscle cells and nerve cells really don't touch each other, but there is a space in between called the synaptic cleft, and that synaptic cleft is going to, um, to be important because the neurotransmitters that are going to communicate for the muscle cell to contract are going to have to travel through. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the synaptic cleft with you a little bit so you can kind of understand how these muscle cells uh, actually work. This is just a little bit more magnified view showing you the motor neuron, showing you the axon. So this is the axon here. And you can see that a signal is coming down the axon to communicate um, that uh, these little synaptic vesicles need to dump their neurotransmitter into the space. Okay, so not shown in this diagram would be that there are these little sodium channels. So these little sodium channels here that allow sodium to flow in. Sodium is a positively charged uh, ion, and uh, you can actually change the charge inside of this structure. Now this little uh, this little receptor over here uh, is called, or actually channel over here is called a voltage gated calcium channel. So when the positive charge flows down because you open up these sodium channels, 
this voltage gated calcium channel is going to allow calcium to flow into this little knob down here um, called the synaptic knob. When calcium flows in, calcium is the signal for these synaptic vesicles to move to this membrane here and to dump their neurotransmitters into this space. Those little neurotransmitters are going to travel across that space really quickly. And they're going to touch one of these receptors down here. And when they touch these receptors, they cause sodium to flow into the muscle cell. Now, sodium is going to flow in, and sodium is positively charged, and so you get a flow of positive charge that flows in, and uh, it's going to cause these other receptors over here, called voltage-gated receptors, to allow sodium to flow in. So basically, we're getting huge waves of sodium that's flowing in. I kind of like to think of it as like a pebble on a pond. So if you look at the muscle cell, um, once you get a, a motor neuron causing sodium to flow in, it's like a pebble in a pond and it causes waves of, of, of sodium to flow in across the, the muscle cell's uh, membrane. Okay, and that's going to be really important at causing the muscle contraction. Okay, so I'm going to put this in a little bit more uh, terms where you can have a few notes to look at. But uh, a, neurotran uh, a neuromuscular junction is a place where a motor neuron and a muscle cell uh, fiber intersect. Uh, muscle cells only contract when given the command by a motor neuron. The signal to contract comes from a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. Um, that neurotransmitter is held in synaptic vesicles at the end of the motor neuron. So we looked at the axon and we have the synaptic knob, so synaptic vesicles are at the end of that. Um, so this is the synaptic knob and these are synaptic vesicles that hold the neurotransmitter. When the brain commands movement, the synaptic vesicles will fuse with the cell membrane and they'll dump the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft like we just saw. Neurotransmitters alter the muscle cell and the contraction is going to occur. Okay, just some events uh, at the neuromuscular junction. So I like to give these in, um, in, um, in stages. So what I'm gonna do is show you the steps uh, that occur at a neuromuscular junction, and then we'll go back and look at it uh, graphically with some pictures. So the action potential is gonna arrive at the axon terminal of the, neuro, uh, of the motor neuron. And so the terminal is at that synaptic knob. There are going to be voltage-gated calcium channels that I showed you earlier. Those things are going to open and allow uh, calcium to flood into, into the uh, axon terminal. Calcium is going to cause the, uh, some of the synaptic vesicles to release their uh, contents uh, by a process called uh, exocytosis. So the synaptic vesicles will move to the membrane and dump their products into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter is specifically called acetylcholine. And uh, it's going to diffuse across that synaptic cleft, and it's going to bind to the receptors that are in the sarcolemma of the cell membrane. Again, we saw that earlier on in a, in a previous graphic. When acetylcholine binds to these receptors, it allows sodium to flood into the uh, muscle cell. It also allows a little potassium to leak out. Okay, So you're flooding the cell with positive charge, huge amounts of positive charge. The more sodium that flows in, um, that causes more of a positive charge change, and that will cause what we call a depolarization of the muscle cell. Uh, let's see if I can find a blank screen here real quickly and show you what a depolarization looks like. So a depolarization, most uh, cells in your body are at a constant charge of negative 70 millivolts. And we can look at this graphically. You can actually stick a little microelectrodes inside of cells and actually look at the charge of it. So here's negative 70, here's positive 30, and these are millivolts. And this is seconds, one to five seconds. But a muscle cell at, at rest is at negative 70 millivolts. But if you stimulate it, but with a neurotransmitter and those receptors open up and allow sodium to flow in, the charge as sodium flows in will become positive. Now it doesn't stay positively charged forever. Eventually, you know, those, those, um, those receptors will close and you'll go back to, uh, to a negative 70 millivolts. 
okay so I can see a rise in positive charge I can see a, a fall in positive charge but this change you know being able to change from negative 70 to positive 30 millivolts that is called depolarization so this is depolarization this is repolarization or going back to negative 70 millivolts let me go back to where I, to where I was okay so that depolarization is really important if you don't get depolarization you can't get a muscle uh, actually contracting so the action potential which is the wave of positive charge flowing across the um, the sarcolemma or the muscle cell membrane remember pebble in a pond it's the wave of of positive charge um, these these are going to eventually open up voltage gated sodium channels on the surface of the muscle cell those are going to allow sodium to flow into the muscle cell and uh, and uh, that's a really important part of muscle cell physiology. Now, that acetylcholine that touched the receptor, it can't sit on that receptor forever and ever and ever. Okay, if it did, then the muscle would continually contract forever and ever and ever, and you would die from spasmatic paralysis. So, but uh, the acetylcholine, uh, the effects of it are terminated by, uh, by uh, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Okay. So those things will go through and they'll gobble up the acetylcholine, destroy it, so you can, you can have muscle relaxation. So there are voltage-gated potassium channels that are closed until the, the sarcolemma goes back to being negative. Remember, you just cause it to become positive, and uh, once you start becoming more negative, you actually get voltage-gated potassium channels that will... Uh, that will um, uh, stay closed until the until the negative charge um, is uh, is uh, acquired again. These potassium channels help to restore the electrical conditions, that is, the negative 70 millivolts of the resting muscle cell. There's another little pump ion pump in there called the sodium potassium pump that also helps to restore um, the resting state negative 70 millivolts potential. Perhaps your biology 101 teacher went over the sodium potassium pump with you. I think I'll do it a little bit more when we do a nervous system. But there's a little pump that dumps out, you know, at, at, all the time while you're alive. It dumps out sodium and brings in potassium uh, in all of your cells. But it takes out more sodium than it brings potassium in. For every three sodium that it takes out, it brings uh, just a few potassium back in. So it helps to maintain a negative 70 millivolt charge. All right, so let's talk, look at these steps to a muscle contraction. So as the action potential spreads across the sarcolemma, it eventually dives deep into the muscle via the transverse tubules. Because, uh, so, the, so the action potential doesn't stay on the surface of the muscle cell. And there are, in these T-tubules, these little invaginations of the sarcolemma, there are these, uh, these voltage-sensitive proteins that are zippered with calcium channels um, in the uh, in the um, the in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let me show you what that looks like. So here we have a T tubule diving deep in. Here we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum where all the calcium is stored, and we have voltage sensitive proteins that are zippered with these calcium channel uh, proteins. Okay, so that's what it means to be zippered with that. And uh, when the action potential reaches these voltage-sensitive proteins in the T-tubule, it causes them to change shape. This shape change will open up calcium channels, so it will dump calcium in massive amounts, and that will be released into the sarcoplasm or the cytoplasm of the, uh, of the muscle cell. And it looks like this. So here's your voltage-sensitive proteins zippered with your, uh, with your calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is sarcoplasmic reticulum, this is T-tubule. And here's all the calcium there. If the, if the charge comes in, if positive charge comes in, this particular protein here will change its shape so that, and since it's zippered with or attached to the, the calcium channel protein, it causes the calcium channel protein to change its shape, which opens up a little, uh, a little pore there and allows calcium to flow out um, into the muscle cell. Okay, so this is showing you the T tubule and uh, how it dives deep into the interior of the muscle cell. And you can see it's intimately, you know, uh, linked with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
Notice that the sarcoplasmic reticulum extends out all across those myofibrils. So this is a myofibril here. Okay, so the, remember, this is storing calcium. And uh, these things have to have calcium. These myofibrils, these little filaments here, have to have calcium in order for a muscle contraction to occur. So we have a way to contain the calcium. We have a way to dump it out. So remember that as the action potential is spreading across the, the, the cell membrane of the muscle cell, it dives deep. And because we have these voltage-sensitive proteins linked up with these calcium channels, you know, if we change the voltage inside the cell, it changes the shape of that, which changes the shape of that to allow the calcium to be dumped out across the myofibrils in all directions. Now, calcium is going to be important because it will bind to a protein called troponin and remove its blocking action, uh, remove the blocking action of another protein called tropomyosin. Let me just skip ahead and show you what that picture looks like. So there is a protein called troponin located right there, and there is another protein called tropomyosin located right there. Now these little, I guess you can kind of see them a little bit, but there's little pink dots right there. Those are receptors that this thick filament can grab a hold of, but they're being blocked right now. They're being blocked by tropomyosin. So the only way that the thick filament can grab a hold of the thin, thin, thin filament and cause it to slide to the interior, thus a muscle contraction, is that these, this tropomyosin has to be rolled off of those binding sites. Well, this troponin right here attached to tropomyosin, if you, if you take and change its shape, it will actually roll the tropomyosin off those binding sites. Okay, so let's go back and finish up our notes there. So troponin, if I join calcium with it, will remove the blocking action of tropomyosin thus allowing um, um, the thick filament to grab a hold of the thin filament. So the myosin is the thick filament, and in its energized or cocked form, the head can actually attach to the thin filament, called actin, and form a bridge, a cross bridge, or a link. When, uh, and so ADP and, uh, and ATP is really important in this process. So uh, when ADP and inorganic phosphate, which are attached to the uh, thick filament, are released from the myosin thick filament head, the myosin will pivot. It'll grab a hold of the actin and pivot, pulling the actin uh, towards, the, uh, to, towards the M line. Um, and uh, so when you slide those thin filaments towards the M line, you get a muscle contraction. So this is how the muscle contracts. So after AP, so, so, so once you have the, the thin filament slide across, ATP will weak, weaken that cross link that's made between act, uh, actin and myosin, and it'll, it'll weaken it and break it and detach it so that myosin can relax and you can have muscle relaxation. Okay, so that's how you have muscle relaxation. As ATP is hydrolyzed or broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate, the myosin will return to its cocked uh, head uh, the cocked form so it can grab a hold of actin again and you can make a muscle uh, muscle contraction even stronger or you can have a, a muscle relaxation all right just showing you a, a few pictures of what we just described you may have to go back and you know look at that and maybe read a little bit in your textbook of that uh, it's not a it's not a super super uh, easy concept to understand but you know play around with it and and practice with it and you'll get better at understanding it so just showing you a few of the terms here. Here's the thick filament. Here's the thin filament. The thick filament, you can see, has heads on it, and uh, they can be cocked. You know, ATP will cock them, and they can be used to, to, uh, to draw in uh, the thin filament towards the M line that's located right here. This would be the M line right here. If I pull actin this way and pull actin this way toward the M line, I can get a muscle contraction to occur. Now remember, tropomyosin is blocking the, the ability of the heads to join with the, um, with the thin filament. Troponin, if you take and you stimulate it with calcium, will, will unleash the, the, the tropomyosin so that the heads can grab a hold of it and you can slide the filaments to the M line, thus getting a muscle contraction. This is just showing you a, a cycling of, of, the, um, of the thick filament. Here's the thick filament, here's the thin filament. Here, if you have uh, the ability to attach to the thin filament, there's the myosin head, 
with ADP and inorganic phosphate attached to it. When those things are released, the head will pivot, thus grabbing actin and pulling it towards the M line. If I have ATP, I can release it. Now, if you, uh, if, when you die, or if you ever see a dead body, dead, dead people don't make ATP anymore. And so you get, um, you know, you don't get a release of the muscles, and you get muscles that will, uh, once they contract, won't release, and you get rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is caused, causes the stiff body effect of a dead body. But if you have ATP, you can release the attachment points. You can see that here it hydrolyzes and it puts it back into its high energy configuration. And if it releases over here, then you get it, it bending, sliding, acting towards the M line. Again, take a look at that and, uh, and study that for a little bit. See, what you, see if you have some questions about that for me. This is just showing you a picture of it drawn by an artist over here and what it looks like under an electron microscope over here. So literally, you can see that in a muscle contraction, looking at the artist's rendition, here the Z-lines are far apart, but during a muscle contraction, the Z-lines get closer together. Okay, So the Z-lines get closer together. The M-line doesn't change shape, but the thin filaments are pulled this way and this way, thus causing the Z-lines to go this way and this way. So in a muscle contraction, you shorten the sarcomere. Notice the sarcomere up here is really, really, really um, wide, but down here the sarcomere has gotten, gotten more narrow. Okay, so the I bands disappear, the A band stays the same, and the thin filaments are just going across the thick filaments, and that's why the I band disappears. And this just shows you kind of an overall picture showing you overall what's, uh, what's occurring here. So we get the action potential coming down the, the, the T-tubule. The T-tubule is communicating, well, the, the proteins here are communicating with the calcium channels to release calcium. Calcium is released. It binds with troponin. That blocks uh, or removes the blocking action of tropomyosin so that the thick filament can grab a hold of the thin filament and you can get a muscle contraction to occur. Okay, that's awesome. It's awesome to know how things work, in my opinion. So, um, it really isn't one motor neuron touching one muscle cell or communicating with one muscle cell, but, uh, but really our body works with motor units. So typically we'll have one motor neuron come down and it may contact 10 cells or 100 cells or 1,000 cells, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Typically it's a one-to-ten relationship or a one-to-hundred relationship depending upon the particular motor unit. Of course, if you cut the motor neuron, you lose the motor unit. And that's just what it looks like under uh, a light microscope. It's kind of cool. You can see, you know, the, the, um, the motor, uh, the motor uh, neuron axon coming out, and this would be a neuromuscular junction here, 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 and here. So that would be a motor unit. Okay, now we got a few problems with muscle metabolism. One of the problems is, is that muscle cells store about four to six seconds worth of ATP. Okay, now you know you can contract a muscle longer than four to, four to six seconds. Okay, so when you contract muscles, you can do it for longer than that. Uh, another problem is that ATP is the only energy source used for muscle contraction. Okay, so we have a problem. We only have four, seconds, four to six seconds worth of it, and it's the only energy source that muscles use. But we know that muscle cells can actually contract longer than four to six seconds. So there's three ways we can, we can uh, make sure that we have plenty of ATP more than that four to six seconds worth that we just have stored. One of the ways is where we take a, a, a chemical called creatine phosphate and we, uh, we it can actually store a little bit of energy using creatine phosphate. There is an enzyme called creatine kinase, which will transfer, you know, and during times of rest, it transfers a phosphate group from, um, from ATP and, uh, and uh, puts it onto, uh, in, in, onto creatine to create creatine phosphate, okay? And what that looks like is this. Here's creatine. During good times, we have lots of ATP. We can take phosphate groups off of ATP, make ADP out of that, and now you have the phosphate group attached to um, to the creatine molecule. So if you're resting, you're actually creating creatine phosphate all the time. Now when you need the, 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 um, when you need ATP, 
the reverse reaction can occur. So the phosphate group can be attached to an ADP molecule to make ATP and thus use it for energy. And now you have creatine again. Okay, so at rest, when you have plenty of ATP, you can create phosphocreatine. So it's a way we can store energy and create um, the ability to, to, to uh, regenerate ATP very quickly. Now, the amount of available energy created by creatine phosphate or liberated by creatine phosphate is about 15 seconds worth. So if you do the math, you have about 20 seconds worth using creatine phosphate and stored ATP. We have about 20 seconds worth of ATP. OK, but you can do, you know, work longer than 20 seconds. OK, so let's look at a different way of um, of generating ATP. So the anaerobic pathway is where you take um, ATP and make ATP by the breakdown of glucose. OK, now you can bring it in from the bloodstream, bring it into a muscle from the bloodstream, or you can use muscle glycogen as your as your um, as your glucose source. OK, but um, but uh, glucose is going to be broken down in the process of uh, of anaerobic respiration. This is just a concept that you learn in 101. And uh, when you break down glucose, you make two molecules of pyruvic acid. And in intense exercise, these molecules of pyruvic acid are converted to lactic acid and they're released into the bloodstream. Perhaps you've heard, you know, perhaps you've heard, felt that pain of lactic acid. That's, you know, that pain is what your nerves sense when there's a lot of lactic acid inside of the muscle cell. So that's just a sensation created by your nervous system. Um, when the pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid and then released into the bloodstream, it's taken to your liver and it's converted into, uh, back into glucose or pyruvic acid um, and uh, used for energy. Uh, ATP from this particular mechanism is released very, very quickly, but you generate very, uh, it, you very, generate very little ATP um, you know, compared to using, uh, you know, full-blown aerobic cellular respiration. So the amount of uh, energy available by the aerobic path, anaerobic pathway, the pathway not utilizing oxygen, is about 60 seconds worth. Okay, so that's about 80 seconds worth. If you add up all the different things, it's about 80 seconds worth of ATP. Not very much. You can still do more work. So if you do extended exercise, you're going to be utilizing the aerobic pathway. And the aerobic pathway is, uh, is how we use um, uh, most of the, when we're doing long distance exercising or, or long term exercises, this is the pathway that's going to generate most of the ATP. So during rest and with moderate exercise, 95% of our, of our ATP comes from the aerobic respiration. Uh, it's slow to start up, but, uh, but it makes lots and lots of, uh, of ATP. It does require lots of glucose and lots of oxygen to occur. You have to have mitochondria. Um, and uh, it's going to release carbon dioxide as a waste product, a little bit of water as a waste, pro waste product, but huge amounts of ATP. So we call that cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration. So as, ex, as, as your exercise goes forward, glucose is provided by the muscle glycogen. It's used by uh, bloodborne glucose. Um, and, uh, and then eventually you start using free fatty acids that are released into the bloodstream from fat stores. After about 30 minutes, fatty acids are the main fuel source that are going to be fueling this. The fatty acids will be converted into products that will enter into um, aerobic cellular respiration. This is just showing you with creatine phosphate, very little, you know, very little ATP is released. With uh, the anaerobic pathway, just a little bit of ATP is released for a period of time. But for the aerobic pathway, ATP can be released for long, long periods of time. So just a few different systems that utilize different, uh, these different mechanisms. So if you, if you use the creatine phosphate ADP method, you know, that's weightlifting, diving, and sprinting, things that you don't have to use a lot of oxygen for or need a lot of energy for long-term um, use. Anaerobic pathways used for tennis, soccer, and 100-meter swim. So that's when you're going to utilize, um, you know, the breakdown of glucose in forming the pyruvic acid. Um, the uh, aerobic system is going to be using full-blown uh, aerobic respiration where you use the mitochondria. That'll be jogging, marathon runs, you know, long, long walks. Those kinds of things will be using that particular system. This is just a picture showing you that we do have different kinds of muscle cells. 
You can see staining them. You can see different kinds of muscle cells there. And uh, maybe you're familiar with this concept, but uh, but we do have uh, you know three kinds of muscle cells muscle cells in the human body and in the in the animal body. Uh, type one are called slow oxidative, and those those are used for like postural muscles. Um, the motor unit size there's going to be for each motor neuron there will be a hundred or more fibers that will be used using that. Um, so contraction speed is slow. The fatigue resistance is super, super high. They have huge amounts of myoglobin to store large amounts of, uh, of oxygen to use for aerobic respiration. Huge amounts of capillaries to bring in that oxygen. Huge amounts of, um, of capillaries make it red. Okay. Um, and uh, it doesn't really use glycolysis that much, you know, that process of taking glucose to pyruvic acid. So, so it doesn't have a lot of those enzymes and uh, huge numbers of mitochondria. So to do that type of work, you have to have that type of muscle cell. Now, walking and intermediate kinds of things will have intermediate uh, levels of, of what I just described. And then if you're doing sprinting, you're going to have, you know, a, a motor unit size of, of two to six fibers for motor, each motor neuron, um, um, you're going to have super, super, super fast contraction speed. They're going to be fast to fatigue, very low amounts of myoglobin because they don't have a, a, a lot of oxygen. They don't need a lot of oxygen. Very low amounts of capillaries because they don't need, uh, they're not utilizing that to bring oxygen in. Typically, they're white and, uh, and they have lots of uh, glycolytic enzymes to undergo that uh, anaerobic respiration. And then, of course, you can look at the intermediate um, cells there. So, you know, some athletes are going to stimulate these particular cells to form more in concentration. Some athletes stimulate these, and then some have an intermediate form. And you can convert these. These can be converted into these, and these can be converted into these, and vice versa. Okay, so the type of exercise you do makes more of one, or, uh, more, more of one type of muscle cell. So a concept that oftentimes comes up when talking about muscles is muscle fatigue. This is your inability to contract, although the muscle may still be, st be, be uh, being sent stimuli from the muscle tissue. Um, and this is a physiological process. Most people give up, um, you know, when, they're, when their muscles feel tired, they get psychological fatigue and they just stop working. Okay, they can't endure the pain of, uh, of the muscle fatigue. Um, fatigue is, uh, is a pretty complex uh, uh, concept. It's thought to be due, due to, in, uh, to uh, imbalances in ionic compounds such as you know, potassium, phosphate, sodium. So there's a lot of different, and maybe even calcium. So, so probably there's different kinds of fatigue due to different kinds of, of ionic imbalances. Um, to finish up, we want to talk about um, uh, exercise and, and uh, what happens after it. After you exercise, you have to convert all your lactic acid into pyruvic acid. Your glycogen stores have to be replaced. ADP has to be replaced and, and, and creatine phosphate stores need to be replaced. Oxygen needs to be put back on the myoglobin and you need to, da uh, to, to repair damaged cells. You do have the ability to, 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 um, to repair muscle cells, but you don't have the ability to grow more of them. Okay? So after myotrauma, after you exercise, there are these little satellite cells that will take and join with and fuse with your, uh, your muscle cells, and they'll, they'll repair your muscle cells and maybe even cause hypertrophy or growth of the muscle tissue. So how can you, uh, what kind of adaptations does your body get when it's uh, um, exercising? You can increase the number of capillaries around your muscle fibers, increase the number of mitochondria, make more myoglobin, develop better glycogen storage, and, uh, and you might even have hypertrophy or growth of the muscle tissue. So it's really important to exercise um, because it keeps you healthy, it keeps your heart healthy, your blood vessels healthy, and it also makes you have the ability to do more work um, and to feel better and more energized. Okay, well, sorry that was kind of a longer lecture, but I just really enjoy muscle uh, tissue. I think it's interesting to be able to understand muscle tissue. Uh, I'm sure you'll have questions after this lecture, so you can rewatch it, read about it. You can ask questions of me. Make sure you always keep up with your work. Make sure you always keep up with your due dates. And uh, until next time, I wish you a very nice day.